Let me introduce our speaker for the night, uh, Dr. Mark Reimers. He is the Associate Professor of Neuroscience at Michigan State University. He got his education uh, as a Bachelor of Science from the University of Toronto, and his PhD comes from the University of British Columbia. He's published over 60 articles on mathematics, brain dynamics, brain genomics, psychiatric genomics, and cancer. He leads the Reimers Lab at Michigan State, which measures brain activity with light and motion, and he's currently developing a high-speed and high-resolution brain imaging system for rodents. Uh, he's been uh, active in the humanist community as well. He was a former president of the Richmond, Virginia Humanists. He leads the uh, uh, United Universalist Church of uh, Greater Lansing's Forum Discussion. Uh, where they talk about science and uh, current events. And uh, he has also been a frequent speaker for uh, the American Human Association and other uh, different kinds of groups. And we're uh, fortunate to have him uh, for the first time for our group uh, tonight. In his free time, he likes to bike, hike, and snorkel, and I just discovered kayak as well. So uh, without delay then, please help me and welcome Dr. Mike Reimers. You can hear me? Well. Great, okay. Uh, so we have a small group tonight, um, and uh, so we'll take a break about partway through to ask uh, to address questions. Lots of uh, things you may want to discuss or disagree with. I think uh, that argumentation is, if, if uh, there's a humanist sacrament, it's dispute and argumentation. <laughs> okay, so what is this guy thinking? Do we know he, he is thinking? So what do we mean when we talk about animal minds? What does it mean to say that an animal has a real mind? As a, and you know, how far does that extend? I mean, what kinds of animals do you think really have minds? I don't think most of us think that the flies we swat or the mosquitoes we crush by the hundred in the summertime really have minds. We wouldn't worry about that. We don't think that the thousands of little worms under our feet have minds. So where does it start? I think most of us would probably agree that a chimpanzee has a mind in a meaningful sense. Uh, probably many of us would think elephants do. How about our dogs? Well, our dogs have to be wonderful, right? I mean, <clears throat> yes, Sparky is just, just full of affection and intelligence. Um, but uh, what about a, uh, a corvid, you know, this scrub jay here? Well, we'll, be, we'll find out that, that uh, those birds manage to retain the memory of over 10,000 distinct locations. Uh, how do they do over 100 square miles? All right, so there's lots of, lots of different animals that might have minds, and it's a little hard to draw a sharp line. Where would you draw the, the line? Many of us would like to think that dolphins have minds. There's, good, I think, good reason to think so. But what about lemurs or marmosets? What about other animals, wolves? We don't know where to draw a line, and maybe that's the wrong way to think about it. Maybe, and I'd like to get you to think about two provocative ideas. First is that maybe there's not, it's not a yes or no. Maybe there's a range of possible minds. So that's the first provocative idea. The second is maybe, maybe that's not just one dimension. Maybe there's several different kinds of minds. So what I'm showing here are brains uh, pretty much to scale from um, from seven different, sorry, eight different creatures, uh, including us on the, do we have a pointer here? Probably not, I should have brought mine. Um, so ours is off to the top left, uh, and elephants is uh, to the top right, quite a bit bigger, quite a bit heavier. Uh, actually fewer neurons uh, in most of the places that count. Um, dolphin has a bigger brain and more neurons, um, 
but very different shape. Uh, gorillas sort of looks like ours, but smaller, uh, about half the size. Uh, and of course, dogs and cats and mice look even more different. Oh, thank you. Just the red button. Sorry, just the red button. OK, great. Yeah, great, thank you. So you know, all of these creatures have different kinds of lives. And we can see you know, visible differences. But if you look sort of at the cells, the cells are roughly the same type, but they are tuned differently. So ours tend to fire at lower rates than those of, let's say, a smaller animal. Um, and need to be more, you know, there has to be a, a higher excitation input to get them to fire. Uh, and elephant's neurons are enormous. It actually has fewer neurons in most of this brain. More neurons here, but fewer neurons here than what you see in a human brain. So, but what's really different is how they're connected. So different parts of the brain are connected in humans that are not connected at all in a dolphin or in an elephant or in a rodent. And they have connections that we don't have at all. Although we tend to have a lot more connections overall. So that's partly what's different. So there may be really different kinds of minds in the way people use the, or animals use the brain power they have. OK, so what's this talk going to be about? I've just given you sort of an introduction to why do we care. I'd like to take this in two parts. Um, the first part is going to be about animal thinking. So we'll talk about planning and memory. And the second part will be about animal feeling and how they have, what kind of emotions they have, we think they have, and how they relate to each other, and then to wrap up why this matters. Oh, sure, thanks. Oops, have I got this the right way around? No? I think I like the red one better, don't you? Okay, so let's start with planning. And I want to show you, you know, what do you, I don't know how many of you hunt big game or shoot deer. Does anyone want to admit to that in the public? Uh, but if you are planning a hunt, what do you do? We well, sit down together and you work out who's going to do what. So that's more or less what these guys have to do before they, they have a hunt. So typically a group of male chimps will hunt together, a group of four to six male chimps will hunt together, and they will work out who's going to go where. Now, it happens that they have, you know, it's like a schoolyard. They all have their favorite roles, or at least the roles that they've been slotted into. So they don't have to work out who's, you know, who's the driver, who's going to make the final catch, those kinds of things. Those are long-standing arrangements, but they have to work out who, which tree each one of them is going to go up in order to catch a monkey, or which bush they're going to go around in order to catch a, a deer. Another evidence of planning is tool use. So uh, Jane Goodall, who's uh, shown at, um, whoops, what happened here? Yeah, Jane Goodall, whom I think many of you recognize, showed that chimpanzees actually use sticks to fish for termites, at least the chimpanzees in her place in Gombe. Uh, what's interesting is that these are, of course, sticks don't grow like this. They don't grow on trees, quite literally. You have to strip them. So you take a bushy branch and you strip off all the leaves and the small twigs and you get a suitable implement for provoking termites to uh, grab onto this and then uh, you can lick them off if you are fancying termites. Uh, <clears throat> I haven't actually tasted them. I've had ants, but not termites. Um, so groups of chimpanzees in other places have different tool using traditions and they tend to, these, these ones in uh, West Africa tend to use uh, uh, anvils and hammer stones to try to crack various kinds of uh, heavy, nutritious nuts that they eat a lot of. So both of these things require a good deal of planning. They have to think, you know, this chimpanzee has to imagine what would it take to make a good uh, stick for termites. These chimpanzees have to think about what kind of uh, hammer stone would be suitable. They want a heavy one. And then what kind of, sorry, what kind of anvil they're going to use, a heavy anvil, and what kind of hammer stone, which is, shouldn't be too heavy, but still solid enough. Now, 
chimpanzees were really quite a surprise when, they, when it, Jane Goodall showed that they used tools, but other animals use tools, including some birds. So these are New Caledonian crows, and they uh, fashion these uh, things very much like the chimps do by stripping off leaves from various barbed fronds of uh, plants in um, uh, New Caledonia. And um, they, they use them to hook out grubs from these holes in the wood that the, the grubs have excavated. These are big fat grubs, like about this big. So uh, quite a tasty treat for a, for a New Caledonian crow. Now, um, birds can do even more than that. So besides fashioning tools, some birds can plan ahead um, what they're, you know, they, they certainly can cache food. So these uh, scrub jays cache many, um, many pine nuts in their native habitat in the southwest uh, of the United States. But even um, nuthatches, whom some of you see walking upside down on your uh, trees, are also, one of the reasons they're doing that is so that they can slip little seeds under the bark or into crevices in the bark. And they'll remember where a good number of them are, not all of them, but a good number. Uh, one of the interesting things that um, uh, Nicola Clayton showed was, uh, who studied the, these, uh, this kind of thinking, was that birds, even common crows, can figure out that um, if they bury something that's perishable, like burying one of those grubs, that it's not any good after a day. You know, it, it kind of goes rotten. If you've ever tried to eat day-old grubs, I'm sure you know what I mean. But, <laughs> you know, they're not very tasty. Uh, so if she, get, she, she will give them the opportunity to cache or to store both. Oops, maybe this, maybe you're right. Maybe this, I'll have to go switch to the other one. She gives them the opportunity to bury grubs or peanuts in little sand baskets. And uh, each of those is uniquely identifiable by Lego blocks that she puts up uh, and so that they can remember the configuration and they, you know, they can go right to the particular uh, uh, place where they have cached this uh, particular object. So what she does is has them cache both, put away or store away both grubs, which they really like, and peanuts, which they, they'll accept, but they're, you know, they're dry, they're not very tasty. Um, and she notices that if she uh, takes them away and puts them back after four hours, they'll immediately go for the grubs. And, and they, they know exactly where they all are. If she, uh, if she prevents them from accessing their food tray for five days, then when they come back, they'll immediately go for the peanuts. So you have to think about this. Why wouldn't they go for the grubs? They much prefer the grubs because they know the grubs are stale. And she's already made sure that they can't smell it by re refreshing the uh, refreshing the sand. Uh, so somehow they, they've remembered that the grubs that they put there were put there five days ago and are probably not very good. Okay, so this planning ahead seems to require both memory and imagination. So what can we say about both of those separately? So first, um, memory uh, and imagination both require an area of the brain called the hippocampus. And this was evolved, we think, something like 150 million years ago um, in one of the earliest you know, proto-mammals. Um, so remember that our remote ancestors couldn't you know, compete during the day. Remember, they, the dinosaurs owned the daytime. And the, um, the, our, an our ancestral mammals basically couldn't compete with them in the day, so they had to come out at night, which is why we lost a lot of our color vision, but it's also why we developed, or our ancestors developed, ways of keeping track of pathways. And if you record from a hippocampus, as we are starting to do, and other labs have done many times, you can see that um, if you look at some cells here, um, then as an animal moves along here, this cell will fire. So every place that there's a yellow dot, this particular cell has fired. And as the animal walks along here, gradually other cells 
start to fire, and they'll keep firing for you know about 20 centimeters, you know maybe half a foot, uh, as the animal walks along a particular pathway, and they'll fire only at those positions, and often only in one direction, and that's we think how. Mammals got fairly good at dead reckoning navigation, at figuring out how to go to a place and retrace your steps and come back. So, okay, so far so good. So we have these cells that seem to at least be very specific to locations. So what does this have to do with imagination? Well, supposing you're an animal and you're coming to a fork in the road, like the Robert Frost poem. Two paths diverging in the wood. Well, that, that happens every moment to many small animals. There are two paths diverging in the woods. Which way is the animal going to go? Well, what we can do is we can record from cells in the hippocampus. Remember that each of those cells fires at a particular location. So if the animal has traversed these paths before, which in most cases they have, then they'll have cells that'll fire at each location along each of the possible paths. So if you record their brains, you can work out oh, where they think they are. And the interesting thing is when they're paused right here, just before making a choice, they alternate between firing patterns that look like what, would, what you would see if they were moving to the left and firing patterns that look like what you would see if they were moving to the right and then moving to the left again. And they alternate these back and forth about a dozen times before making a choice. What's interesting is that this is happening, so what, whereas this traversal might take a couple of seconds, uh, rodents are pretty fast, as any of you who've tried to catch them may know. Um, so, so this may take two seconds for them to go around the bend here, um, but this whole rehearsal or, or um, Precognition, if you will, this, this anticipation happens in about a tenth of a second. And they alternate, so we get about seven of these cycles per second. And then they take maybe, you know, if they take a second or two to make a decision, then that's, uh, that's what's going through at least this part of their brain, the hippocampus. Um, what we're trying to do is find out how widespread that is. That's one of the things our lab is trying to do. So there are um, it seems like at least one of the ingredients for imagination or planning is present in the brains of small mammals. And I mentioned the scrub jays again. They typically have a range of about 100 square miles, and they spend the summer putting away pine nuts. There's lots of pine nuts, but there aren't going to be any in the winter. So they, they put them away, and they seem to retrieve something like 70% of the ones they've cached. At least in laboratory studies where they give them uh, up to 1,000 seeds and watch where they put each one, and note, they seem to, rec they seem to recover about 70% of those. So maybe it's a little less in the wild, but that's still pretty impressive. If you look at all the pine trees and all of the crevices and all the stumps you know, in 100 square miles of forest, uh, that's pretty impressive that they remember that. Of course, there are animals that we associate with memory. The elephants, we always say the elephants remember. Interestingly, we have plenty of evidence for this. They'll remember individual people or individual other elephants that they haven't seen for 20 years. But they'll also remember where they got water you know, 20 years ago during the last drought. And if there's another drought, they'll retrace those steps. Usually the matriarch of the herd who was a, you know, a young mum back 20 years ago uh, will lead the rest of the herd on. Um, elephants are a matriarchal society. Okay, let me pause there. So Tim, if you wanna hand out the microphone and we'll take a few questions. Okay, I'll come around. We're working now. Okay, good. I'll come around and hand you the microphone and uh, wait to ask your question till you have it so that we can get it recorded. Question at the back there. Oh. Okay. How are you um, determining? 
you're you're recording rodents of some sort. How are how are you doing it? What's your, what's your process for? Well, there's that? a number of different ways to do it. Um, some people stick electrodes in their heads, uh, and some people uh, put windows in their skull and put a fluorescent uh, dye in the neurons that flashes little lights when the neurons are signaling. So it's sort of like sparkling lights. Um, how much variation do you see among like certain kinds of animals? Like, are some really good at it, and are some just very forgetful? <laughs> you mean about memory generation? So we're talking about different species of animal, not not individual differences. Well, individuals within a group. Okay, individuals within a group. So um, mice of the same type are fairly fairly similar in their behavior, although even there we see mice of exactly the same genotype, so they're uh, clonal mice. They, um, some of them are very shy, some of them are very aggressive, some of them are very cool, like they, they like people. We have, abs they've been, as far as we know, raised under identical conditions, given uh, identical food, and we do not know why some mice are very bold and some mice are very cooperative, but we like those kind. <laughs> Uh, and some mice are, you know, uh, aggressive, and some mice are so shy that they seem to throw a fit. And of course, when you look at more complex animals, there's huge variations in personality. Um, one of the truisms of, of monkey neuroscience is that you can never get two monkeys to behave exactly the same way. Um, you know, you, you think you can set up the experiment in exactly the same way, and they Three different monkeys, you have three different results. And three different brain areas. It's very frustrating. <laughs> you said that um, when the uh, apes are planning a hunt, they have to uh, figure out who's gonna go to which tree, mm -hmm. but they already know who's gonna do what job. Yeah. How do they know that? I don't know myself. Um, I have not read that anybody knows how that's assigned, but it's usually the dominant alpha male who gets the fun job. Uh, that's not so dissimilar to <laughs> other parts of life. Um, and um, usually the, the catchers have to, so they usually the alpha male is the driver who goes up into the tree and shakes around and, or rushes at the deer. Uh, and then the others are stationed strategically around about and have to intercept or catch whatever animal they're trying to catch. And then has to share under compulsion. Any other questions? Um, not sure how to ask this, but how does the idea of consciousness relate to all this sort of memory and decision making? So we can't even tell what consciousness is for human beings. It would be really arrogant to think we know what it is abstractly. You know, if you've, you've ever interacted with chat GPT or some other large language model, it seems spooky sometimes. Um, uh, but as far as, um, as far as I know, yeah, or as far as I think, um, consciousness is also something that is sort of either on a gradient or maybe multi-dimensional. And it's not an all or nothing thing. Many, many animals show the kind of characteristic brain activity that we associate with perceptual consciousness or awareness, but many of them don't show the kind of activity that seems to, you know, when we're in debating something internally. They do. A few of them do, but not very many. So the short answer is we really haven't a clue. <laughs> okay, so let's resume, I think. Okay. So I've talked about, you know, what you might think of as cognitive abilities or, or knowledge abilities. Uh, what do animals feel? And again, here we just have sort of external observations to guide us. We don't really understand what a, a different, you know, what an emotion really is. We don't even know that for human beings. So um, 
we are somewhat guessing, but we can find some good correlates of various kinds of emotions. So one of the things that we humans look for in other people is their facial expressions. So is this person sad, or is this person happy, or is this person angry? You know, we can read their faces, read their gestures, and get some sense of how they're feeling. So can, you can actually do this with a mouse, or at least maybe you and I can't, but um, the, uh, uh, whoops, where are we, where are we? But the uh, authors of a paper about four years ago showed that it was possible to distinguish reliably between a mouse that's just hanging out, being um, and not doing anything in particular, a mouse that has you know, had a good treat, is enjoying something, and a mouse that is terrified. And you wouldn't think, just from looking at their faces, you wouldn't think so, but if you look very closely, and here's their map of where to look. So if you look very closely, you can see that, yeah, when they're kind of enjoying something, their ears go up. When they're fearful, their ears go back. Sort of like a dog. Um, and that may be a pretty widespread phenomenon. These pictures were actually, um, they're actually density plots of where an artificial neural network is finding the most differences in configurations. So this is, these are all done by artificial intelligence because these are pretty subtle differences. Most human beings would have a hard time, untrained human beings would have a hard time noticing and seeing these differences. But um, here you can see that the, you know, the lips down low, he's, he's uh, ready to bite if, if something comes close. So um, we can associate specific facial expressions with specific um, emotions. How do we know they're having this emotion? Well, because they're giving them sugar water or because they've you know, made a very loud noise or something else that's really going to terrify this animal. And this paper has about a half a dozen other discrete emotions and their facial expressions that are brought about reliably with particular kinds of stimuli. So it seems like many, even the, the humblest animals, have some sort of emotional repertoire. We can't be sure what they're experiencing, because of course they're, we don't, they're not talking to us and we don't know what kind of consciousness they have, if any. But one thing we do know, if, if you, this is, doesn't work so well with mice, but it works pretty well with rats. If you have ever had a pet rat, and the pet rat trusts you, they love to be tickled. And um, when they're tickled, they will squeak or laugh, but not so you can hear. Typically, this will be out up around 50 kilohertz. So that's about four times higher than most of us in this room can possibly hear. Uh, so, um, so two octaves higher than, than we can hear. And, um, you can, but you can, you can record that with an ultrasonic microphone uh, and play it back at a slow speed, and you can hear that they're, that they're having a good time and laughing. And they'll come back for more all the time. So, um, so it seems like rats can have fun. And maybe lots of other animals can, too. Um, interestingly enough, rats are capable of what you might think of as uh, an almost moral emotion. We talk a lot about empathy in humanist circles because we think empathy is an important part of morality. Uh, so can other animals feel empathy? It seems that they can. So this experiment has now been replicated dozens of times, but the idea is you put a, a rat in some sort of enclosure that, or in cold water or something that they really don't like. And then you get their friends to come by. And their friends will usually, not always, especially if they've just had a fight, they, <laughs> they won't, but their friends will usually stop by and try to help them out. Um, the only ones that regularly don't are two competitive males that have been fighting over females. Um, but they'll work hard at this, and if you tempt them with chocolate even, which they love, it's bad for them, but they love it, um, they will, um, most of them, not all of them, but most of them will even forego chocolate in order to help their friend. Um, so this, you know, I think this suggests that at least some sort of empathy is pretty deeply 
rooted in many, many different kinds of animals. Some of you are looking a little surprised at that. Any questions or disagreements? OK, we'll move on. What about their social life? Or which, you know, how do they communicate with each other? Do they have politics? Well, they do. And could they even have some you know, culture of any sort? That's very debatable. So what do animals say to each other? Well, most animal species do communicate with each other. They'll call to each other in various ways. As far as scientists can tell, and this has, of course, been argued about for centuries, but as far as we can tell, most of these are signals of something immediate right now. So the one you mostly hear is a threat signal. So when you're walking through the woods and the birds start that uh, cheep, cheep, that, that really aggressive call, yeah, they're warning other birds that there's a big primate lumbering through the woods. And um, so, uh, of course, there's an awful lot of communication between animals that live in groups about who's you know, higher than who on the totem pole. So there'll be lots of you know, various threats and grimaces of this sort. Monkeys do this an awful lot. And of course, there's, you know, will you come and share a nest with me and have my babies? And we hear that a lot with birds as well. So right about now, we're hearing a lot of both of the territory kind and the uh, uh, the mating calls. So, but are there some more subtle things? Well, most bird calls are pretty stereotyped. Not all, we'll come to some exceptions. But some animals modulate their calls, although they modulate them in ways that we find it hard to distinguish. So they can be softer or harder, sharper, faster. Um, they can change them in ways that we don't necessarily attune to because we don't listen to this every day and we don't think they're meaningful. But, uh, for example, chimpanzees have a repertoire of something like 40 to 60 calls, depending on who you ask, that each signify discrete events, various kinds of predators, various kinds of food. So how, do they, how could they convey more information? So remember, you can't see very far in the jungle. So if, if chimpanzee Joe over here finds some you know, good figs, like this one has, and is minded to share, which they're not, they're not always minded to do, but often they are, because uh, it gives them status. Um, so you know, there's far more figs than chimpanzee Joe can, can eat here today, um, and it would be good to share with friends. So how is he going to indicate uh, where they're, you know, how many, how is he going to indicate how many there are, and one way to do that is to lower the pitch. So they'll lower the pitch of the fig call in order to indicate that there's an awful lot of figs. And if there's just a few figs, they'll have a higher pitch for it. So they can, they can modulate their calls, but as far as we know, they don't have language. They don't put together the calls for you know, figs and a call for Fred chimp over here and a call for eating and say, Fred ate the chimp, Fred ate the figs yesterday. As far as we can't find anything that they're calling that could plausibly be interpreted that way. So now there's some, you know, I mentioned that there may be calls, specific calls for particular kinds of predators. So it's not just chimps, but also monkeys have very specific kinds of calls. And this makes sense if you know, if there's um, a leopard, you want to go one way. If there's a snake, you want to go up in the tree. If there's an eagle, you want to get down on the ground. Um, so it makes sense to communicate specific information that way. Um, but as far as we know, they don't seem to combine this with, you know, a, a, a call that means to the, to the right or, you know, over by the big tree or something. Um, some birds have specific calls for specific threats. Um, that's maybe not a surprise, but there's some evidence that certain animals, in particular dolphins and some parrots, have individual identifiers, uh, what you might call signature calls or signature whistles for dolphins, that um, identify them to the group that they often come you know, and announce themselves with a particular call. Now, this is controversial, but there are some scientists who think that they can hear those calls 
in other animals when the, when the owner of that sign, signature call is, is not there. And they're, they speculate that they are, these animals are gossiping about you know, Dolphin Fred or you know, parrot, Parakeet Jane. You know, what's Parakeet Jane been up to? Um, this is very speculative. We don't have any hard evidence. But they certainly, it's certainly interesting that, they do, that both of these animal, kinds of animals spend a lot of time just talking without necessarily talking about what they're doing, which is what most animals do. So jury's still out. Now, of course, um, if they can recognize each other, they'll have you know, long-lasting relationships and friendships. Um, some of these friendships are very, shall we say, instrumental, in, as Aristotle would say. That is, you know, what can my alliance with Chimpanzee Joe get me? Well, it can get me you know, a, 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 a united front against the alpha male, and we can push the alpha male out, and then we will have access to all the females. Um, but you know, when, once that's ach achieved, they may have a falling out. Um, there's a really good book um, by Franz Duval called Chimpanzee Politics, which was his very first book. And uh, it's uh, really worth reading even today. Uh, and so there are long lasting, but there are also chimpanzees that hang out just because they like each other, even though neither of them has anything to gain. Neither of them is a rising star. Neither of them is going to get ahead. They just like each other. And um, they seem to spend a lot of companionable time together. And some other animals do the same thing. Uh, some relationships you know, are, very sh are very short term, like most birds kick their kids out of the nest and never want to see them again. Uh, so <laughs> I'm sure some of you felt that way. But, uh, but some animals have long lasting relationships with their offspring th through the, life of the entire life of the parent. So we know that's true for wolves and meerkats and a variety of other animals that live in families. So they can maintain, you know, even though they're changing you know, the pups are grown up. The pups at some point are going to be bigger and stronger than the mum, but they maintain a relationship um, through, you know, perhaps 10 or 15 years in some cases. Now, do they understand others' relationships? So, you know, monkey uh, on the left here, monkey, monkey Joe, may know that he's subordinate to monkey Fred here, um, but does Joe know uh, what the relationship between Fred and Jane is. Well, it turns out they do. So if, you know, so a number of experimenters have done a, a study where they, you know, record lots of interactions so they know who's who in the pecking order and, this, and then they, but they make recordings of all the animals' calls. So each, each mo a monkey has a distinctive voice. So they make recordings of all the animals' calls and then they play them back, but they play back, let's say, uh, a subordinate monkey making an aggressive threat call uh, after a dominant monkey has made it, or sorry, and then a dominant monkey making a submission call. Now, the, the logic, you know, this is inverting the social logic. If the monkeys don't recognize or don't keep track of others' relationships, it'll just be like another threat call in the background. They've, they've long ago learned to tune them all out. There's so much fighting going on in the background. It's worse than politics here. Uh, that they, you know, they usually tune that out. But if they hear, you know, um, let's say that Joe making a threat call and Fred making a submission call, when they, for the, you know, the last six months, Fred has been dominant to Joe, they'll all turn around and look and their eyes will get wide. And they'll wonder, you know, you, it's almost as if they're saying, what the hell is going on here? So they can, they do seem to be able to track other, other people's or other monkeys' relationships. So if they're that sophisticated, do they, you know, do they have anything like what you, culture? That's what's made human beings so uh, powerful around the world. Well, it seems that chimpanzees have something like culture. So what, what, what would culture be? So it would be a skilled activity that one group does that a genetically identical group doesn't do and vice versa, and that's passed on by instruction or by modeling the activity or by demonstrating the activity to the, new, to the young chimpanzees, but is not in any way instinctive. And it seems that 
In fact, a lot of animals have differences in how they eat or how they approach certain kinds of common problems depending on the group that they belong to. Um, and this was really first clear with chimpanzees. Um, it turns out that you know, Jane Goodall thought that all chimps uh, fished for, ch for termites, but actually only a very few do. Not too many of the chimps in other groups outside of her Gombe Reserve in Tanzania actually fish for termites. But a lot of the West African chimps will crack nuts, but there will be neighboring groups who are, as far as we can tell, genetically identical, who don't crack nuts. So they seem to have learned this and passed this tradition on. There's one chimp group in West Africa that's gotten in the news recently because they have taken to making spears. Yes, seriously. <laughs> small spears, but they, they uh, do a lot of damage to small bush babies. Rather unpleasant, but that's, that is part of their culture now. Um, it seems that even birds have some kind of, do we want to say culture, or at least some different uh, habits between groups. So some groups of crows handle you know, their tools in one particular stereotype fashion, and other groups of the same species, you know, maybe just a few miles away, will handle the same kinds of tools in a somewhat different fashion. And that you could recognize from how they handle it which group they belong to. Is this culture? Hard to say but it's certainly related to, to culture. So how can, we, you know, how can we draw this all together? How can we think about uh, you know, what we owe animals or how should humanists think about, about animals? So I'm gonna suggest that we avoid two extreme caricatures. The first is the one that I think Rene Descartes popularized and that many scientists are inclined to believe, uh, and that is that animals are just mechanisms, just machines like wind-up toys, and you know, once they get going in the morning, there's not much, you know, not much going on in their heads. They just execute a, pre, uh, you know, a, a, something, a little program. But I, I think we're pretty clear now that that's false. It's not the case that they're little wind-up toys. But equally, the sort of sentimental idea that they're sort of almost people, that they're just you know, covered in fur and they can't talk. Uh, that doesn't seem to be really true either. So I would say that we should eschew both of these extremes and think that you know, different kinds of animals have their own kinds of problems, their own kinds of life issues to, to solve, and they approach them different ways, their own kinds of intelligences, but as far as we can tell, in most cases, it's pretty limited to what's here and now. There's a limited amount of, of memory and uh, long-term planning. But if we're thinking about this as a humanist uh, group, uh, then what do we owe animals and how, what does this tell us about what we might owe animals? Well, I think that most of us would feel that we owe some duty of care to animals that have some kind of sentience. But what does sentience mean? How can we tell, uh, what criteria should we use to decide how sentient an animal is and how much we may owe that animal? I don't have the answers to that yet. I'm hoping that in 50 years we will. If you're interested, um, I would recommend a number of books. Um, this is just a sampling of many really good books, but uh, I think the nicest written is probably Virginia Morell's Animal Wise. Um, Franz de Ball, of course, is a very prolific writer. He just died a, a month or so ago. Um, this was, a, I guess, his book from about five years ago, which I think is, is really one of his best. Um, Chimpanzee Politics, his first book, is, is still very, very relevant. Um, Robert Sapolsky's book is really a comprehensive, a 700-page treatise on you know, what neuroscience can tell you about daily life. It's the book I wish I could have written if I... <laughs> um, if you want a philosophical book, Metazoa is that book, you know, really thinking deeply and, and uh, rigorously about what kinds of minds animals may have. Um, he's an Australian philosopher. Um, if you're interested in videos, I really recommend these two, Bird Brain, which was on PBS Nova, has, has been on several times. And um, those of you who have Netflix may have seen My Octopus Teacher, which is very moving, 
um, very spooky and, and mysterious because you don't, you never really get the answer to, you know, how much does this octopus really know what's, about what's going on uh, or understand? In what way is this octopus conscious? But it does make you think twice about those little Greek octopus uh, dimes that you eat fried. <laughs> um, okay, so let's um, do questions and discussion then, and I'll leave up the... Uh, I'll leave up the, uh, the books for those of you who want to copy that down. Among the chimpanzees with the signals, do disconnected groups use the same types of signals? I wish I knew, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. That's a good question and I'm sure somebody knows. Um, I'll try to look that up, <laughs> but it's going to be a while. On the uh, subject of rat empathy, did you uh, see or hear about the study where they had the rats pushing the bar to get a pellet, a food pellet dispensed, but at the same time it was delivering an electric shock to another rat? Yeah, that was done about, at McGill about 50 or 60 years ago, and it's sort of been lying fallow for a generation. And then about 20 years ago, 25 years ago, some, some younger scientists came across that and decided to test it more thoroughly. It, it looked impossible. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd read about that. And uh, it's funny, it was just, it, it just didn't make sense in terms of the paradigm of scientific thinking at the time. So people didn't say it was wrong, they just ignored it. Um, and then now it's turned out to be important. So <clears throat> I have a question about the, um, you had the slide about the um, mouse uh, uh, brain or the areas of the mouse brain that were active during pleasure seeking, the sugar water, and then the fear. And what struck me on the it one- was the mouse face, yeah. Or face, rather, not the brain, the face. But whatever the illumination was, I don't know what- That what was the, just to focus your attention on, let me just get that out here. So whatever, well, there you go, that was the second one. Yeah. So the one over here with the passive fear, the image, again, I don't know what that image is, but it looks like there's a lot of activity or movement maybe in the nose area. And so I was wondering, the, you know, for many researchers, it's easy to measure physical movements, <clears throat> auditory type stuff. Is anybody looking, <clears throat> sorry, at olfactory um, uh, issues around scent release or response to scent and things that we're not very good at, at, at measuring. But is anybody looking at that in terms of communication uh, among animals? Yes, people do. They're typically more animal behaviorists or ethologists rather than neuroscientists. Um, it's hard to do experiments in a lab with smell because the, the smells are not very controllable. You know, you open a vial of something and then who knows where it wafts. Um, it's hard to control exactly what stimulus the animal's getting. Uh, I think that that's kind of a shame that we aren't investigating that. But you're asking, you know, the study of how they use scent to communicate. So most mammals have two parallel smell systems. The classical olfactory system, which is what what we have that you know, smells peppermint and you know, roast chicken and all kinds of other things that are good to smell or bad to smell. Uh, and then a pheromone system that picks up you know, various kinds of body odors and mating pheromones and indications of fertility and things like that. In primates, that system is mostly atrophied. There's some controversy over this. Um, some people insist that it's still active, but at least a lot of experiments that have been done to try to record activity there have, have failed. It doesn't mean that there's nothing, it just means that it's very, it's very subtle if it's there at all. Um, whereas in most mammals, like a mouse or an elephant, that system is as strong as our, you know, our, our olfactory system that picks up smells of food or decaying vegetation or whatever else we're trying to either get toward or avoid. Um, so, People know that there is this secondary system, but it's, it's typically studied, you know, not by people who are studying the brain, 
per se, but by and the parts of the brain that that connects to are very deep. They're very hard to record from. Sorry, that's too long an answer, but <laughs> yes. I was very intrigued with your uh, with the picture of the different brains of different animals, mm -hmm. and that some were connected in different ways. What sorts of studying is being done about how how they work differently? Well, as you might imagine, it's pretty hard to get an elephant in an MRI scanner, <laughs> or even to wire an elephant with an EEG electrode. <laughs> it's pretty hard to really know what's going on in their brain. Someone finally got a dolphin in an MRI scanner. Uh, I don't think the results were particularly impressive. Um, uh, you can imagine it's not easy to get a gorilla in a, an MRI scanner. Um, there are now, in the last 10 years, a number of labs have managed to get dogs in an MRI scanner. So uh, they can start doing you know, recordings of at least you know, which areas of the brain are working harder. Now, in terms of connectivity, we don't even know what the real connectivity of the human brain is. Um, we have a pretty good idea of the connectivity of a mouse brain. Where did that go? Down here. Um, and we have bits and pieces of the connectivity of a monkey brain. But gorillas and humans, um, we're still guessing a lot, although we have some broad ideas. We have only the vaguest idea of the connectivity of an elephant and dolphin brain. And that's largely from brains from dead animals that have been dissected and we sort of look at where the, you know, the fibers are crossing. Um, so it's very, very crude, but enough to know that there's clearly, there's big differences, but it's hard to be sure which ones are which. Is that answering your question? But yeah, but for example, we have a lot of connections between the frontal areas this, this, these polar frontal areas and, uh, let's say, our amygdala and other structures that even a gorilla doesn't have, which is part of the reason we're so self-controlled and don't get as upset as gorillas do. <laughs> yes? So to what extent do you think animals have a sense of time? Oh, this is hotly debated right now. Um, I, I, I don't feel I can say anything intelligent about that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they'll, you know, whether, whether animals can keep time internally is, I mean, we certainly they can, you know, cycle every 24 hours, and that'll be pretty reliable. But in terms of can they time things to tell the difference, they can, they can be trained to tell the difference between doing something at four seconds and at, at six seconds, but it's very hard for them to be trained you know, four sec to distinguish four seconds from five, to wait four seconds as opposed to wait five seconds. So they probably have some ability to keep time, but not much. Yes? So th there's been some stuff that I've read lately about, like plants and trees making, you know, sort of distress noises or, um, and yeah, I've read that communicating too. and stuff like that. Um, have you followed, you know, how do you think that ties into this type of stuff? Is there sort of one more level of this kind of? I, yeah, I don't know what to think about that. <laughs> um, you know, assuming that they've done the measurements properly, uh, it's, it's surprising. Um, I don't know what to think about it. It it's certainly, they don't have a nervous system, so whatever, you know, they can communicate in some way that's been an advantage over the past hundred million years, but are they having experiences? I'm pretty sure not. Um, the, 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 the speed of which these signals tra transfer is much, much slower. And, and also, how does kinship, like kinship, I imagine, plays a big role in that? Like, I remember reading about the rat thing, and I think they said that if they were not like a kinship group, or like a group that was raised together or something, they wouldn't show the empathy, but they did when the other rat was part of their group. Yeah, they're much more likely to with a, a known, you know, cage mate rather than a stranger. Um, there's been some, yeah, some work on on you know what it is that makes them feel better about a, a someone they you know a rat that they know as opposed to a stranger. It seems to involve oxytocin 
but it probably involves 100 other chemicals, too. Seats? Sure. Um, your study you showed there, you had it previously with the mouse, the mice, and the physical changes with, the, for instance, the sugar water. Mm -hmm. Under the banner of It Takes Two to Tango, communication involves, of course, at least two individuals. So what the researchers were able to do there was identify f what perceived physical changes in their facial structure, indicating, again, pleasure or passive, but that only works if it's perceived by their conspecifics. Did that study address the conspecific response saying, look, Fred's happy, look, Fred's afraid, because this is just one side of the communication formula. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think for us, many of our emotions have a very prominent social aspect. You know, when we're angry, we're usually angry at somebody or we're angry, we want to demonstrate our anger to somebody, even if they're not angry at that person. So uh, these emotions were all, you know, recorded in isolation. And we think that they reflect sort of bodily states rather than social communicative states. Uh, monkeys and chimps do seem to make faces, you know, somewhat deliberately have some control um, and so they'll, some of their emotional expression does seem to be more socially oriented, not just reflecting how they're feeling right now. Um, but we don't think, maybe, you know, could be wrong, but we don't think that too many of the, the, these kinds of basic emotions in a mouse are, are social, but we do think that, they're, uh, that they do have social emotions, but they're not very well understood. What kinds of things do we know about how uh, dogs and cats' brains work? Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, <clears throat> uh, as far as, so I don't think that they put cats in a scanner and they won't tolerate EEGs, so we don't. <laughs> have a lot of knowledge about cat brains, but we do have a number of experiments studying you know, cat intelligence, or you might call cat intelligence tests or dog intelligence tests. I think I've got, uh, where's the cat? Yeah. Um, so uh, interestingly enough, uh, so dogs, as you know, are descended from wolves not very long ago, just uh, maybe a thousand generations or so, maybe a couple of thousand generations. And um, they, uh, generally don't seem as intelligent as wolves if you give them classic animal IQ tests. That is, you know, you ask them to solve a problem, you know, move something out of the way in order to get at a treat or something like that. They don't seem as to be as smart as wolves. On the other hand, they're much better at getting us to help them solve a problem <laughs> than wolves are. <laughs> and interestingly, um, of course, the dog genome's been sequenced and compared to the wolf genome, and there's something a little under 200 places where there's a noticeable difference. And one of those places is in exactly the same locus as um, the gene mutation that gives Williams syndrome in human beings. If you know what Williams syndrome is, it's kind of hypersocial syndrome, someone where they trust everybody, everybody's their best friend. They are very, they talk a lot, but they're not very critical. They, they don't think very critically about anything. Um, so they're, there's, a, there's a few prominent people with that, but they're, they generally have a hard time in life because they're, they're easily taken advantage of. So dogs are like that. They'll, you know, they'll trust you almost no matter what. I mean, uh, cats, as far as we can tell from the classical animal IQ tests, are about as bright as dogs which you have to admit is not very bright because they're not. <laughs> uh, but of course, yeah, if you tell this to a cat, I've, I just have given up arguing with cat lovers. I mean, it's just, it's just no point. I, I know your cat is the most beautiful and most intelligent animal. <laughs> um, so then now we can go and have a beer, right? <laughs> if I could ask a follow-up, is it possible that uh, domesticated animals' brains devolved because they didn't need whatever the skills were in the wild that their ancestors had. Oh, that's certainly true of sheep and cattle. Um, yeah, you, you, you just have, uh, they're much less able to solve basic problems. Uh, sheep will get themselves caught in fences. 
and, and yeah, they, they're, they basically not had to hone their skills. Uh, you know, when you, when you look at the, you know, pictures, uh, cave art in, um, in Europe and, you know, these thundering, you know, dangerous bulls, um, you know, with, with uh, flashing eyes and fearsome intelligence, and, you know, you look at our cows and bulls and you think, oh, is this the same animal? Well, it's very much, you know, as you say, very much selected for docility, not necessarily for intelligence of any sort, and certainly not for independence of thought. Yeah, one more question. I know we should. All right. So, I mean, one indication of intelligence is like understanding levels of interaction. So, if I'm playing with someone, we fall down, and there's dirt on their nose, I might wipe no my nose because I see their nose is dirty, and I might infer maybe mine is or something like that. Where you see one thing and then infer something else. Do we see signs of that in animals where they're able to use sort of like a certain amount of Indirection or inference? Uh, people have looked for that kind of thing for evidence of some sort of logical complexity, and I, I would have to say the evidence is not there for it. There's a few people who, who claim that, but uh, the bulk of the scientific community doesn't find that very convincing, and I don't find it convincing. How are we doing on time, and is there any more questions? We're uh, right on time here. Let's all thank uh, Dr. Reimers for the lecture tonight. Very, uh, 